Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the function of synaptotagmin, specifically concentrating at the moment on its binding to syntaxin 1. Okay, so we've discussed how calcium is going to bind to synaptotagmin, and basically what synaptotagmin now does is it binds to syntaxin 1. Okay, so this protein here, basically, on the membrane of, uh, well, on the membrane of the cell, basically, on the plasma membrane. And that may well contribute to how it, um, it's going to fuse these two membranes together. So, uh, now what I will do is I will present a, um, a um, piece of experimental evidence for it binding to syntaxin 1. So I'll present the experiment which was done uh, to show uh, that um, synaptotagmin binds to syntaxin 1 in this way. Okay, and this was done uh, by, I believe, Ed Chapman. So I'll give his name. He's done a lot of research into the function of synaptotag uh, synaptotagmin. We'll see his name again. Okay, so Ed Chapman. Right. Okay, so, let's discuss the experiment that was done then. So, in order to understand the experiment we're going to do, I need to tell you a little bit about a molecule known as glutathione. Okay, so glutathione is going to be a prerequisite for understanding this experiment. So, we're going to, I'm going to tell you something about glutathione. Okay, so glutathione is a molecule made up of free amino acids, but they're not joined in simple amino acid way. Well, the first two are, but then the third one isn't joined in the way that you would normally have amino acids joined. So glutathione is not merely a tripeptide. It is made up of free amino acids, however. So, uh, the first amino acid which we'll draw right down here, so we'll start at the uh, carboxyl terminus, right, which is unconventional for amino acids, but never mind. So the first amino acid is glycine. Okay, so glycine's R group is just a hydrogen, basically. So here's the carboxylic acid of the amino acid. Here's the amino group, which I haven't drawn in full because it's going to be linked to something else. Here's the hydrogen of the alpha carbon, and then you've got another hydrogen because this is glycine here. Okay, right. So let me just highlight this in. So in green here, we have the glycine amino acid. So this is glycine. Right, so what's next in glutathione? Well, you have glycine bound to the amino acid cysteine. So here's the carboxylic acid group of cysteine. So it's linked in a normal peptide link to glycine. Then you have the alpha carbon with a hydrogen off. And then the R group of cysteine, which is a methyl, sorry, a methylene group. And then a thiol group, so sulfur bound to hydrogen. Okay, and then you have the amino group again. So this is cysteine. So everything's just a normal peptide so far. So this is cysteine. Okay, so let me highlight that one up as well. So I'll draw the bond that's going to come off here. And this is our cysteine amino acid residue in glutathione. Okay, so, so far, very simple. We've just had glycine with cysteine. Now we're going to have glutamate. But it's not going to be bound by its carboxylic acid group, uh, which forms the backbone of the amino acid. Instead, it's going to be bound by the carboxylic acid of its R group. So, this is the carboxylic acid group of the R group of glutamate here. And then we have the rest of the R group of glutamate. So here is the two methylene groups, which are the R group of glutamic acid or glutamate. Here's the alpha carbon. Here's the hydrogen off the alpha carbon. To make it crystal clear, I'll draw the amino group and the carboxylic acid group like this. So here is our glutamate or uh, amino acid. So basically, we've bound glutamate to the cysteine and the alanine, but not in the conventional way that it should have been bound. If we were just making a um, tripeptide here, and then we'd have bound glutamate via this carboxylic acid down here. But we haven't. We've made glutathione instead. So this is the molecule that is glutathione. Now, glutathione, its most important amino acid is this cysteine, this sulfur, and this, well, this thiol group here, as it's called. So this is a thiol group here. 
Okay, and this is going to be very, very important for the function of this molecule. So when we denote glutathione in short, we take the G for gluta, and then thione, instead of writing thione, we put SH, because that's the thiol group. So glutathione is often abbreviated to GSH for short. Right, now our experiment is going to involve an enzyme known as glutathione S transferase. Glutathione S transferase. Okay, and this isn't just one enzyme. There are a huge number of glutathione S transferase enzymes. We're just keeping this nice and general, not too specific. We're just going to use A, glutathione S transferase. Now, what do glutathione S transferase enzymes do in the body? Well, what they do is they add glutathione molecules onto other biological molecules, other proteins potentially. So what they might take is they might take a protein here and they might link this molecule to that protein. So let's call this protein protein X. They might take this glutathione molecule here. They will take that hydrogen off the sulfur and they'll bind that sulfur to the X. So we might denote it GSX like this for gluta. And then to denote that we've taken the hydrogen off this file group, we take off the hydrogen, then we'd have the sulfur bound to the X. So basically you can add glutathione groups onto proteins and that's what this enzyme does. Now, what's interesting about this enzyme is that when it gets its hand on, hands on a piece of glutathione, it binds to it initially. So in the process of adding the glutathione group onto a protein, it forms an intermediate with the glutathione. So let me guess, go onto another piece of paper and draw this. So basically, what's going to happen is our glutathione S transferase, which by the way is often denoted GST for glutathione S transferase. What it will do is, I wish I'd drawn it with an active site. Um, let me, um, let me uh, make it a little bit bigger like this so that I can draw it with a little active site there. Basically, when it wants to take a protein, let's say this is protein X, and it wants to link glutathione onto that protein X, what it will do is it will bind to glutathione, so let's say this is glutathione, uh, GSH here, and it will bind to it via this cysteine thiol group. So it has taken the hydrogen off the thiol group and it's bound to that cis sulfur group, uh, sulfur atom. And it basically forms this intermediate where the enzyme itself, the glutathione S transferase itself, is bound to the glutathione. And then it's just waiting basically for it to find a protein that it can then stick the glutathione onto. So, what was the point of this discussion? The point of this discussion was for me to tell you that glutathione S transferase will bind to glutathione, basically. Okay, so this is the idea behind uh, the assay by which we can decide uh, whether uh, syntaxin and synaptotagmin bind. And this was what Ed Chapman did. He basically took syntaxin 1 proteins. So here is our syntaxin 1, which remember was this T snare in the membrane in the plasma membrane, which formed this core snare complex with synaptobrevin 2 and SNAP25. And he linked this enzyme glutathione S transferase onto syntaxin 1. Okay, so here's our glutathione S transferase. Now this will bind to glutathione if glutathione is present. So let's put some colour on this diagram. Let's denote glutathione in turquoise here. Let's denote uh, glutathione S transferase in orange here. Okay, because everything looks far easier once we colour code it, because then we can just see from the colours what everything is. So orange is glutathione S transferase. We have linked glutathione S transferase onto syntaxin 1 here, which is in purple. Now, we are trying, what are we trying to do in the end? We are trying to see whether synaptotagmin and syntaxin bind to one another, basically. So, what we do is we now add in our synaptotagmin, basically. Now, if our synaptotagmin binds to syntaxin, then it will bind. So, 
let's say this is our synaptotagmin. I'll try and draw it with its normal structure. So here is our synaptotagmin with these two, two C2A and C2B domains. So this is the C2A domain and this is the C2B. And I'm sorry, I've denoted by this picture that it's the C2B domain that binds to the syntaxin 1. I'm not sure whether that is the case. Okay, so here is the, um, uh, the um, portion that anchors it in the membrane. So, this is synaptotagmin. The point of this picture is supposed to be that synaptotagmin binds to syntaxin 1, not that specifically the C2B domain binds to syntaxin 1. I don't even know if that's known which bit binds. But something in the synaptotagmin molecule, which is in blue here, binds to the syntaxin 1. Now, what we do is we get beads, basically, and I mean, I don't mean like beads that you have used uh, once to, um, you know, to make bracelets out of when you were free or whatever. Uh, I mean tiny beads, and I really mean tiny micrometers uh, in diameter beads, and you can make these tiny little beads. Well, you probably won't make them, but uh, factories can make them. And Nowadays, what you can get is you can get these tiny little beads, which are micrometers in diameter. So this is tiny little bead, and you wouldn't be able to see it. And you can get them, basically, which have uh, glutathione, GSH for short, bound to them. Okay? So you can go to some biological experiment catalogue, and you can order tiny little beads which have glutathione pre-attached to them, okay? Now, what happens if you mix in uh, to, with these beads this syntaxin 1 enzyme with the glutathione S transferase attached to it? And obviously, it's also now got this synaptotagmin which you've mixed in because the synaptotagmin is hypothesized to bind to syntaxin 1. Well, what's going to happen is the glutathione is going to bind to the glutathione S transferase. And that means that you'll have this little bead attached as well. And of course, this is totally out of proportion. These proteins will be tiny, minuscule, even compared to the beads. The bead will be massive compared to them. So one bead will have absolutely loads of glutathione molecules attached to it. Those will attach to loads of glutathione S transferases, which are attached to loads of syntaxin 1s. And therefore, we're going to get loads of uh, synaptotagmin bound. Now, what you can do is you can, uh, you can separate these beads out, basically. You can put this in a centrifuge, which is basically just a machine that spins a test tube around really fast. Okay, now, if you spin a tube with these beads in, these micrometer-long beads uh, in, really, really fast, so we put it in a centrifuge here, then what happens is the beads drop to the bottom and will form a pellet. So the beads are going to drop to the bottom and form a pellet. Now, that bead will have the glutathione still bound to it, which will have the glutathione S transferase bound to it, which will have the syntaxin 1 bound to it. Now, if it's true that synaptotagmin binds to syntaxin 1, the synaptotagmin will also be in the pellet. So, what you can do is you can, add, uh, you can um, take this pellet out and find out which proteins are in that pellet. And if synaptotagmin 1 is within that pellet, then you know that the synaptotagmin binds to the syntaxin 1, because that's the only way that it could have ended up in this pellet. Okay, right. Uh, so that's, uh, how, um, that's how we can test uh, that synaptotagmin binds to syntaxin 1. And if you do this experiment, you do indeed find that there is synaptotagmin in that pellet indicating that synaptotagmin binds to syntaxin 1. And I also just want to label something up. Uh, these synaptotagmin molecules here, um, there are 19 different types of synaptotagmin protein. Uh, the forms that are found in uh, the axon terminals of neurons are synaptotagmin 1, and synaptotagmin 2. So this will either be synaptotagmin 1 or it will be synaptotagmin 2 that we're talking about here.